First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie, what's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year 10. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the 23rd to the 26th, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, uh, actually, I think it's the 24th to the 27th. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So... Well, I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but... Suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So... What have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching, and I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and... Is that the campsite in the Lake District? No. Actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid £5 a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid £10 for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only £4 per night. And they told me that if we had over 50 children, which we do, they could give us a further 10% off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. OK, so, now, these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes, go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around 7 on Friday evening. It'll still be light then, and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At eight, we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare. And that children love. Yes. Then, lights out would be at 9.30, so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at seven on Saturday morning. 
Breakfast would be at 7.30, an hour's hiking from 8 till 9, and then a couple of hours at the lake. That would take us up to 11. I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know? Yes, great idea. And then? Let's see, a picnic lunch at 12, and then sports in the afternoon till 4. Another swim until 5, and then supper. After clean-up, around 6.30, we could have a talk-back session, where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at 8, back to the tents at 9.30, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organized games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. We'll hear part of a talk given by a member of staff at a hospital. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello and welcome to the homepage for the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery, where we'd like to share a little more information about the services we provide and more. Our hospital is one of the leading specialised hospitals in the United Kingdom attracting the very best healthcare professionals from around the globe. Not only are we a leading medical practice, but we are also the only hospital in the United Kingdom dedicated entirely to the treatment of and research into the curing of hearing loss. Our facilities and staff here are renowned across Europe, attracting thousands of patients a year. Our consultations can number anything up to 11,000 patients a year. However, we aim to treat around 5,000 patients a year so as to maintain and ensure the quality of our services. Our patients are guaranteed the highest standard of care, as well as the use of our first-class facilities. All patients requiring overnight treatment are provided with their own private room with ensuite facilities as well as a state-of-the-art entertainment centre, which includes a flat-screen LCD television and PlayStation. Appointments with our healthcare professionals 
can be made at any time during the week, with female doctors available between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. If you need to see a doctor outside of these times, please visit the Out of Hours page of our website for more information. Our doctors are all trained to an exceptionally high standard and practice a vast array of specialities. Mr. Roberts is a fully qualified ear and throat specialist. Mr. Edwards is a pediatric hearing specialist, while Mr. Green specializes in reversing hearing loss. For more details about our people, please visit the staff members page on our website. During a consultation, doctors will sometimes decide medication is required, for which patients should receive a prescription. There are several pharmacies within the city. However, we recommend that patients use the pharmacy housed within our healthcare facility. Our in-house pharmacy is well stocked at all times. Our products are competitively priced and our pharmacists are on hand to help and advise from 8 a.m. until 10 p.m. from Monday to Saturday and from 9 a.m. until 12 p.m. on Sundays. If you require any help outside of these hours, please see our Out of Hours page on the website. Since the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery also functions as a teaching hospital, we aim to provide our students with every opportunity to expose themselves to medicine in practice. Therefore, we would like to encourage our patients to give their consent for a medical student to attend their consultations. If our patients are not comfortable with this, there will be a form at reception where patients will be able to opt out. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, please look at the map I've given you of the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery. For those not familiar with our practice, reception can be found through the main door at the end of the corridor. If your consultation is booked with Mr. Green, you need to go through the main door and turn right by the nurse's desk and his office is at the end of the corridor on your left-hand side. If you need to alter any of your personal details, please visit our secretary at the Office for Medical Records, which you will find next to the therapy room. If you're awaiting surgery, please first check in with reception before taking the first door on the right after you enter the clinic. Finally, in the event that you feel disappointed with any of the services we have provided or have any further questions, please locate our manager's office, which can be found near the office for medical records and between two closets. If you have any more questions about the Healthy Hearing Medical Clinic and Surgery, please do not hesitate to contact us on 01 256 111 1. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, Jake and Amanda, 
How did the project go? Very well, I think, Dr. Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically, what makes successful people? Let's call them top achievers successful. Yes. How are they different from us? What do they do that other less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it. But it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself, with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax, could leave their work at the office, prize close friends and family life, and spent a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway, go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important though, Amanda. Yes, I agree. But being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two-thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer and only one-third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Actually, in the end they often have both, because they enjoy what they are doing, so their work is better and their rewards higher. Yes, Jake, that certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hard-working people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright she is so worried that she has missed something, she still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well... Top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. They don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them, so they can do better next time. Hmm. Well, would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I, or we came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes, 
and we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognised that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes, loners, who are often over-concerned about rivals, can't delegate important work or decision-making. Their performance is limited because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job and learned something into the bargain too. Now there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. You will hear a talk on the research of architecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome class to your very first lecture in this series on architecture conducted by myself, Dr. Torben Dahl. Today we will be looking into the relationship between climate and architecture where I will be giving you a critical overview of the main climate influences that shape the design of buildings. Throughout this lecture series, we will be looking at the latest research into climatic design carried out by experts in the field, in addition to case studies and examples drawn from modernist practice both in cities and rural areas. Now, acid rain is one of the climatic elements with the most devastating effects on our architecture. The chemicals in acid rain can cause paint to peel, corrosion of steel structures such as bridges, and erosion of stone statues. Since the 1970s, our government has been making great effort to reduce the release of these chemicals into the atmosphere, with positive results. Private organisations have also been raising awareness and funds, and recently received a huge donation from the bank. It is interesting to look at the studies that have been carried out into the effects of acid rain at varying altitudes. Research has shown that there are lower levels of acid in the damaging pollutants at higher altitudes, meaning that skyscrapers are much less vulnerable to the negative effects as they are exposed to acid rain with far lower levels of damaging pollutants. Recently, the ALTA project was founded to carry out further research into acid rain this project is directed towards studying the effects of acid rain on old, traditional buildings of stone construction that are vulnerable to damage caused by acid rain. Masonry is particularly vulnerable as it is easily corroded and weakened by the acidic chemicals. It is imperative that we protect these buildings as they are valuable examples of our history and culture. Pollution is one of the main sources of concern in the present day. The construction industry contributes considerably as a source of pollution in its day-to-day -day processes of creating building materials such as concrete and glass. However, more new sustainable methods are being developed to counter this. A recent case study for this is Sky Tower, whose windows have been made from recycled glass 
to prevent pollution from the glass making process. Water is the most problematic element to be considered in construction. It is imperative that construction elements, such as the insulation, are fitted into the building in dry weather to prevent it from getting wet. This makes winter an undesirable season for construction, as the heavy rainfall can have adverse effects on the building. Another climate type that has an enormous effect on buildings is humidity. Constructions made of steel and stone are largely unaffected by humidity. However, it can have a serious effect on wooden constructions if the timber has not been correctly treated. Moisture from the air can condense in the grain of the wood, which then swells and shrinks in proportion to the magnitude of change in its moisture content. This variation in size can have disastrous consequences. In areas of the world that are prone to earthquakes, certain design and environmental conditions are preferable for protecting buildings in the event of a tremor. Engineers have come up with numerous building procedures to help minimize shaking in buildings. For example, tall buildings have height restrictions and counterweights, and multi story buildings have reinforced floors and walls. Ground conditions are a cause for worry in many constructions, as often the soil is of the wrong density to protect the foundations. Luckily, technology has now been developed that can help to minimize damage by earthquakes. Seismic sensors can give prior warning when an earthquake is about to happen, so that preparations can be made to protect both the people and the buildings from harm. The movement of building structures can now also be measured and monitored over time by architects. It has been expressed by architects within the design community that it would be valuable to be given special courses for designing buildings within earthquake zones. Guidelines are also expected to be produced by the government in the near future that will give architects a universal checklist to follow. That wraps up the lecture for today. Please remember that attendance is mandatory. That is the end of part four.